Hello and welcome to GameSack. This time we're talking about not 2D, not 3D, but 2.5D games. And what is 2.5D, you ask? Well, let me tell you. 2.5D is the effect of 3D all while everything's on a 2D plane. Ooh, wow, uh -huh. like everything's playing 2D, but the, like, the backgrounds and stuff are like at polygons and stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. And one of the examples I'm going to show today is just mind-blowing. One of them. The, the other two. Suck. No, they kind of suck. No. <laughs> anyway, if you know you still don't understand what we're saying, like we don't, uh, <laughs> let's just go into the games themselves. This is Pandemonium, developed by Toys for Bob and published by Crystal Dynamics. I'm playing the PlayStation version here, but it was also released on the Saturn, PC, and yes, even the N-Gage. This game plays like Klonoa, and in fact, it was the main reason I bought it back in the day because I really like Klonoa. Even though this game came out first, I never played it because just looking at the cover, I had no interest. Plus the title, Pandemonium? That does nothing to get me interested. Not that a game like this really needs a story, but the girl Nikki takes a spellbook from a drunk wizard. Her, the Jester Fargus, and his hand puppet Sid run to the rooftops. Here, Nikki casts spells from the book, and the last one that she casts summons a huge demon which is going to do massive damage. So as you start the game, you're going to really see that the story means absolutely nothing, and you're here just for the platforming. You can pick to play as either Fargus, the Jester, or Nikki. They are different from each other, so choose wisely. Actually, you can switch between characters between levels if you want, so being wise is only a suggestion. You can be dumb if you want. Nikki is the one that I like, as she has a double jump that is very handy. Fargus has this cartwheel move that he does that kills enemies. This is nice and all, but it's no double jump, so I'll always choose Nikki. Besides that, each of them control the same. In every level, you can collect an icon which will allow you to throw fireballs. This is always great for killing enemies from a distance. The problem is that once you take a hit, you lose this ability. It's annoying, but it's no reason to kill yourself. You still can jump on enemies which will kill them just as easily. In general, the game controls just fine. I feel that the jump mechanic is a bit floaty, but it's nothing that you can't get used to the more you play. And as you play, you collect these coins that are all over the level. If you collect 300 of them, you get an extra life. This isn't a bad deal since it's not too difficult to die in this game. If you collect 80% of the coins, you get taken to a bonus level. In this level, you have to go as fast as you can. I do okay until I reach these stupid boards in the middle of the path, and then I get overtaken by this ring of fire, and that ends the level for me. There's another bonus level if you collect 95% of the coins, but honestly, who has time for that? Generally, the game is pretty fun to play. There seems to be more of an emphasis on platforming and enjoying the 2.5D level design than there is on killing enemies. Of course, there's enemies in the game, but they feel pretty spread out. They all have patterns that they follow, but they just don't seem to care that you're there until you interact with them. Hell, just jump over them, they won't care. The graphics, while not pretty these days, still have a charm to them. A 32-bit charm, I guess you'd call it. The same can be said about the music, which feels very right for this game. It's kind of ugly, but it has an aural charm to it that brings back memories from this age in gaming. You know the time when developers switched from chiptunes to full-on CD audio. The only true annoying sound that I don't like but I hear it more often than I want to is the sound when you die. Honestly, I'd rather just have silence than hear this trombone or whatever it is. There's not too many games that play like this out there, so try it if you haven't. It just might grow on you. This is Napletail, Arcia, and Daydream for the Sega Dreamcast. I originally bought this one not long after it was released because some of the magazines said good things about it and I heard some of the soundtrack which was really good. So does it live up? Eh. Honestly, there's just too much Japanese for an English player to figure out and I just don't want to use a guide through the entire thing. The 2.5D sections look and sound fantastic though. Gameplay wise, they play okay. You play as a girl with some giant wind-up thing stuck in her back. I wonder if she'd get along with the dude from Clockwork Knight. Anyway, you run around collecting treasure and defeating enemies. The game lets you move towards and away from the screen, and because of this, it can be kind of hard to judge depth at times. But what really brings the game down is the 3D hub world. This is a town where you can pretty much wander wherever you want, and there is a lot of text in this game. Even if it were in English, it would be far too much text for this kind of game. 
Of course, in order to access the 2.5D stages, you have to do things in the 3D hub world. And because of this, as well as the copious amounts of text, most of the game seems to take place here, sadly. Unfortunately, I've never really been able to get very far, even with a guide, because I just get bored with it. Like I said, the graphics look great, and the music by Yoko Kano is fantastic and quite different. When it comes down to it, I can't really recommend this game, but I figured I'd show you all what it is and get some use out of my old purchase. Okay, since that review ended quickly, let's take a look at Yoshi's Woolly World on the Wii U. In this game, everything exists as some sort of knitted yarn creation for absolutely no discernible reason. But the evil yarn Bowser minion or whatever it is turns all the yarn Yoshis into unknitted yarn. Then of course they get hidden all over the game for whatever reason. The stories in the Mario Universe games have never been deep or even good, but whatever. It really doesn't matter. You just know that you need to save the day. The stage select takes place in kind of a simple 3D-ish world, but the gameplay itself is strictly 2D. It plays a lot like Yoshi's Island, except with yarn instead of eggs and of course no baby Mario. So right away you know that the game has a really good design. You stun and eat enemies and then crap out some yarn. Eh, that's gotta be pretty painful for the enemy, don't you think? You also commonly get yarn from boxes. Anyway, your attack is a cursor that moves around and then fires in the direction that it was pointed. You use up one yarn turd each time you take a shot. In this game, you can also use the yarn to fill in blank areas to generate platforms and other ways to make it across the stage. Sometimes you poop out a really big yarn. These bigger yarn turds are a lot more powerful as you might have guessed. One thing that I really like is that there are a lot of hidden areas to find. You unravel these by pulling on a stray thread, which is a cool idea. This game also has amiibo support. Hell yeah! We were given some amiibos by a fan at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo in 2015. And honestly, this is going to be my first time ever using an amiibo. Let's see what all the hype is about. Here goes. Okay, I guess maybe we'll try this one. Wow, the hype is real. Anyway, before you start a level, you're often able to choose a badge. You can make the level easier or maybe even clear the course without even playing. Jeez. Personally, I always play with no badge. After a few levels, you'll have to deal with an evil yarn boss. Like most Mario Universe games, they die after only three hits. Some of them can be kind of tricky to figure out at first, but once you know what needs to be done, they're absurdly easy. That's not necessarily a complaint because sometimes you'll still die trying to figure them out. After levels and boss fights, you can see messages from other players. This guy must have had a really tough time with the World 1 boss. There's also the occasional bonus game and lots of other things to add variety. I like this. The graphics are excellent and feature really detailed yarn textures. It doesn't quite look real, but it's pretty damn close. And of course, everything is extremely colorful. That's one of the things I like about Nintendo. They actually use color. The music is well done and really nice. Some of it even quite catchy. All right, this is my biggest complaint. It's time to lay it all down on the table. And that complaint is, is that some of the levels feel just a little too big. You know, I'm not even really sure if you can call that a complaint. Eh, whatever. I definitely recommend this game. I mean, it's the Wii U and it's from Nintendo, so if you have the console, you probably already own the game. Here's Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins for the PSP, developed by Toast and released by Capcom. After Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Capcom decided to make some side games. These included Gargoyles Quest 2, Demon's Crest, and the less than average Maximo games on the PS2. In 2006, they thankfully went back to the roots of their franchise and released an all new game in glorious 2.5D. At the center of it all, this is a great entry into the series. There's a few odd things going on here, but they're not bad additions, they're just different. Firstly, Arthur can now hang from ledges of platforms and such. It felt kind of strange at first, but I did get used to it. 
And also, you don't have a double jump right away. You get this nice little ability after beating the first boss. All through the first stage, there's icons that are just out of reach, and I'm thinking, how in the hell do I get these things? Instead of giving you this ability right away, you have to earn it. Probably the best part about this game is that in addition to the double jump, you can shoot up and down as well. It feels so good to do both of these. So not only do you have to earn abilities, you earn other things as well, such as shields and magic. I guess they figured a basic platformer couldn't make it in the gaming world of 2006, so they had to add things like this to give it some depth. I guess it worked, but for some reason I really didn't venture into these subscreens and mess around with them. Arthur can also collect four different types of armor and shields. These range from the basic type to other types that have an effect on your speed or attack power, for example. All I know is that when I'm running around in my boxer shorts, I'll take any armor I can get. This leads me to mentioning the game's difficulty levels. Depending on what mode you choose, different things will happen. On the novice mode, you have more lives, your armor has a life meter, you get knocked back less after being hit, and your weapon is powered up when you come back to life. Standard mode only gives you two lives, but your armor still has a meter, and when you die, you start off close to where you die, if not right at that spot. Ultimate mode, like the original games, knocks your armor off after one hit and you restart from the beginning of the level when you die. As if this game isn't hard enough as it is, I'm just not a masochist so I won't ever be playing this game on ultimate mode. I really like that Arthur spawns close to the same spot when he dies in the easier modes. There's not a huge break in the action and you can get right back to it. And even with these helpful additions to the game, it's still very hard. I've died tons of times. There's enemies everywhere and hard jumps to make and you still have that bastard wizard guy around. What humor he finds in turning you into other things, I have no idea. Yeah, it's not funny at all. I just love the graphics in this game. The backgrounds are loaded with haunting imagery of death and despair and I just love it. There's so much detail in everything in this game that I just pause it sometimes to soak it in and enjoy. The soundtrack is just as haunting as the graphics. The first stage features a remix of the first stage music in previous games, but the rest of the soundtrack is almost new. You might hear some familiar notes here and there, but it's just enough to bring back memories of music from the older games. Ultimately, pun intended, this is a great Ghosts and Goblins game, and if you still have your PSP, I recommend a playthrough. This is a great game for around Halloween time, but it sucks to play in February, though. back. Dave, was Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins the one that was supposedly mind-blowingly ultimately amazing? No, that is a good example, but it's not mind-blowingly amazing, which obviously is going to be coming up in the next segment. So don't go anywhere, all right? All right, well, let's just get back into the games. Yeah, I'm going there. Let's look at Mighty Number no. 9. This is the PlayStation 4 version. Super long story short, this game was crowdfunded a few years ago by Keiji Inafune, who's best known for his work on the Mega Man series. People lapped it up, hoping it would be a great Mega Man clone. Unfortunately, Inafune is more of a businessman than a creative individual, and he made some infamous blunders along the way, like stating that the game is better than nothing and other such nonsense. I don't think fans will be so trusting of his next venture. Anyway, so how is the game itself? Well, in my opinion, it's a mixed bag. You play as Beck. Yeah, Beck. You're on a mission to reacquire the mighty numbers one through eight as they've gone rogue and are up to no good. The game tries to be a spiritual successor to the Mega Man franchise. First of all, I gotta say that Beck looks like an idiot when he runs. Anyway, I wasn't one of the people who contributed to the crowdfunding. I just pre-ordered the PS4 physical copy when it became available a couple of years ago on Amazon. I never watched any video of the game in progress, and I didn't even look closely at it or play it when I saw early builds at conventions. People weren't being overly positive, and I didn't want to be jaded. When I finally got the game myself, I was really enjoying it. I did my best to ignore the tutorial stuff, and I figured most of it out on my own. And honestly, that's really the best way to play these types of games if you can. Tutorials can bite me. You have a dash move that you pull off with the right shoulder button. You can shoot enemies many times to destroy them, but before they die, they turn into a certain color and they're stunned. If you dash into them, you gain slightly increased powers. Plus, it's quicker to do and far more fun. When you fight something with a life meter, you must dash into them at certain points for the meter to remain depleted. I really enjoyed it when I figured all this out on my own. And if you've never seen anything from this game before, well, guess what? I just ruined that experience for you. You're welcome. 
Honestly, you're going to be dashing all over the place in this game. You can tell the designers really liked this move and decided to make almost every platform only accessible via the dash. That's pretty much okay as the stages are really, really fun to play. They're large and you will die, but it's one of those games where you keep saying, just one more time. What I don't like, however, are the bosses. They are completely unbalanced with the rest of the game and not really much fun to fight at all. The just one more time style of play doesn't really apply here. Plus, they look so unimpressive. I assume that you get their weapons when you beat them, but I'll be honest, I haven't beaten a single boss yet. Believe me, I've tried, but they're just not interesting enough to fight when they're so unbalanced. There are a few other things that I don't like, such as when you get frozen. It takes far too much effort and time to unfreeze yourself, and it gets really aggravating. Also, I can't shoot up, down, or even duck, but that's a nasty limitation that Mega Man games have always had. I'm guessing that the fans love it. But hey, that's just the way the game works, so I'm not going to hold it against it. The visuals, honestly, while pleasant, kind of remind me of something we might see on the Nintendo GameCube. In fact, I bet the original Xbox could do visuals very close to this even in high definition. Now, I'm not saying that every game on the PS4 needs to look like it couldn't have been done on any other system, but it does kind of look like they used some low-budget tools to build this one. That said, this is really only a minor gripe for me, but it needs to be said. However, I've heard that other versions, especially the Wii U, have major problems with slowdown and the frame rate. Not good. The bigger aesthetic gripe is definitely the sound. First, the music. The music was always my favorite part of many Mega Man games. The music in this game, while not ear grating or anything, is just average. It has absolutely no personality. Next are the voices. You have a team of NPCs helping you out, and like most games since the invention of optical disc media, there's tons upon tons of radio chatter. And they talk about things that don't matter at all. Things that a two-year-old would figure out. Beck, the airship is losing altitude. Please abandon it immediately. Why do developers keep thinking that their games need stuff like this? It's a waste of money in my opinion. Anyway, you can change the voice language or silence the volume, but you can't turn off the text boxes that pop up. And sometimes these boxes can even get in the way and block what you need to see in order to advance. And you can't dismiss them. Why do NPCs always have to be so chatty? Just shut up and let me play, nobody cares about you. Overall, I don't think the game is as bad as people might let on to be. But thanks to the unbalanced bosses, it's no masterpiece either. It's also a great example of what not to do if you have a crowdfunded project. This is Puppeteer for the PlayStation 3, developed by Sony's Japan Studio and released in 2013. Being a modern title, this game came with no instruction manual, and I really hate that. Instead, you have an option before launching the game to view the digital version. This is so annoying and is just one more step before companies go totally digital. So the game is basically you playing as a puppeteer controlling a puppet in a puppet show. Again, being a modern game, there's tons of story here and this game is loaded with cutscenes and truly awesome voice acting by all the actors here. In a nutshell, you're out to collect the pieces of Moonstone which were stolen by the Moon Bear. He gave them to his 12 generals and you must defeat them all. You do this with a pair of scissors that you use for a weapon. You also must rescue the souls of other kids that were turned into puppets just like the character you control. Right away, the character that you control gets his head chopped off. This is interesting because as you play the game you can acquire different heads. Not only do some of them look cool, but they do cool things. If you have the right head in certain situations, you can use its ability which will change things in the background. Or you can get taken away to a bonus stage. I really like the aspect of having different heads in this game. Each one has its own animation and they're really fun to watch. You can only hold three heads at any moment, but you can switch between them at any time, even during cutscenes. There's always going to be things that you can't do because you don't have the right head, but that's where the replayability comes in. Once you get the correct head, you can go back and replay a certain level. So not only do you control the puppet, but you also control this floating cat called Yin Yang. His whole deal is that he can find hidden things all throughout each level, and he gives you a device which is sometimes useful and sometimes not. Eventually, he gets swapped out by a girl that you rescue called Picarina, who is the Princess of the Sun. She does the same thing that the cat did. Apple 
by the horns and won, right, champ? I've got to say that from the moment I started playing this game, it felt very special, and I felt like a lot of hard work went into making this title. Graphically, it's so realistic to a puppet show that even now I just sit in awe at what I'm seeing. The screen has the outline of the stage and curtain. Foregrounds drop and backgrounds come in just like a real puppet show and they have that feel of a handmade set. Each background has so much detail that I just want to play each level multiple times so I can soak everything in. Same goes for all the characters on screen. Each one is loaded with detail and your character really looks like he was carved out of a block of wood and his movements match that feeling perfectly. And just like at a puppet show, there's audience reaction. When something happens on screen that they like, it's really cool to hear them ooh and ah and laugh. Like here when you have Yin Yang mess with his shield on the wall and you see this little puppet inside trying to hide. I love hearing the audience's reaction. This happens quite a bit and it never gets old. And of course the soundtrack is worthy of the game. I can almost imagine a symphony pit filled with musicians playing while the action unfolds on stage. In all honesty, this is one of my favorite PS3 titles. So much love went into this title and it shows through and through. If you haven't played this game, then I beg you to play it. It's a title that every gamer should experience and it can be had brand new for under $20. Play it and let me know what you think. I see we've upgraded to dinosaurs. A triceratops. Ooh, yes. Kuturin found himself astride a triceratops. Second only to the T-Rex on the Dinosaur Top 40. Have you got your ends and your means mixed up? Because in the end, you need to rescue me, and that means you have to hurry. <laughs> Do you see what I did there? How about some G. Darius on the original PlayStation, developed by Taito and published by THQ? And of course, the G in G. Darius stands for 2.5D horizontal shooter with lots of robo-fish. Anyway, who says 2.5D games have to be platformers? This game is a pretty good follow-up to Darius Gaiden, which I reviewed a little while back on the Saturn. If you're familiar at all with Darius, the basic core of the game works the same. Grab different colored icons to power up your main gun, missiles, and even get a shield. But what sets this one apart is that you have a stock of capture balls at the bottom of the screen. You can shoot these out in order to capture your enemies and have them fight alongside you. This builds upon the concept introduced in Darius Gaiden and definitely improves upon it. Of course, each different enemy that you capture will result in a different kind of attack. Some can even be used as shields. These guys will fight alongside you until they get destroyed, the stage ends, or you press the button again and blow them up, which coincidentally is your bomb attack. If you shoot more than one capture ball out at a time, you might even be able to capture more than one enemy. You can even capture bigger enemies, but they need to be worn down before you capture them. Like all Darius games, you choose your next zone between stages. However, this one also lets you choose your route midway through some stages. Just stay on the top or the bottom of the screen when you see this line to determine where you fly next. The boss fights here are longer and more memorable than a lot of Darius games. Oh, did I say bosses? I'm sorry, I meant HUGE BATTLESHIP! And honestly, some of them will even get kind of boring to fight because they just take so long, but most of them are just the right length. Two players can even play at once, but I don't recommend it because a slowdown even in single player mode can get pretty severe. The graphics go in and out and all over the place while the gameplay is, of course, strictly 2D. Hell, this game is king of distracting backgrounds. Still, it looks fairly good for its time and it's not super grainy like a lot of PlayStation games are. The sounds are okay, but what's weird is the music. It's not always there. It'll be playing and then it'll fade away for 20 seconds and then slowly fade back in and there's next to no music at all in stage one. At first I thought maybe my PlayStation was messed up, but no, that's just how the game is. The music is okay at best and nowhere near as good as Darius Gaiden. Still, all in all, it's a really fun game to play and the choices give it a lot of replayability. And if you like Darius games, you should definitely have this one. Alright, there you guys have it. Lots of great examples of 2.5D games. Not 3D, not 2D, 2.5 because there's got to be a middle ground everywhere. There has to be, and these games just prove that. So what was your favorite game that you covered? I don't know. Wow, that's 
probably Yoshi's Woolly World, to be honest. Awesome. So, I mean, that, that's pretty good. I'm really happy to hear that. So, and... And of course, your ultimate game. Yes, with Puppeteer, Puppeteer. Of course, I hope you guys have all played that. I, um, I actually have it, and I still haven't played it. Holy crap, man! Uh, you're in for a great time. That's all I can say. Part of my backlog. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you were gonna see it again? <laughs> yeah. No, I, no, no. But yeah. Um, anyway, what are some of your favorite 2.5 D games? Let us know. And if you guys like this, and we have enough good suggestions, maybe we'll cover it again. Yeah. In the meantime. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. I'll get you, Ness. Not if I have anything to do with it, Mega Man. Joe! Dude, Joe! What? what are you doing? I'm playing with Amiibos. What the hell does it look like? Yeah, you're playing with toys. I get it, but you know, these aren't for outside the game. They're for inside the game. You're an adult and you're playing with these things? What the hell's wrong with you? God. I'm here to take over the entire galaxy. Oh no, it's Boba Fett. Transform!